Welcome to Sports Talk with Kifu, and I'm your host, Kifu and Jabuluaga Masango. And today I'm ve- I'm joined by a very special guest. Uh, he just left a uh, kickoff, if I'm not being mistaken, or oh, soccer I do. If I'm really not being mistaken, I did do. Yeah, just left kickoff, and yeah, Chad Kelly clicked, who I am joined by. And how are you doing? How's it, Kifu? Uh, thanks for inviting me on. Um, you're not wrong in saying kickoff or soccer la Duma because uh, soccer la Duma obviously took kickoff over uh, back in 2017. So the two have been, you know, under the same umbrella for for the last few years. So I have left kickoff and soccer la Duma, uh, even though I was just working on on kickoff um, for most of my time there. Yeah. Okay. So can you please tell us um, uh, where did you grow up and yeah. When did you grow up and how was life growing up? I grew up in uh, what's now known as Kabecha. Um, I was born in a family with, you know, not not a, I don't come from a wealthy background or anything. I mean, mm. a lot of people know from from uh, my brother Dane's uh, story as, as a footballer. Uh, so pretty much the same, uh, you know, lots of flaws in, in our family and all that and mm. Um, I just, I, I grew up in a, you know, a modest, very modest household uh, in a colored township called Galvandale. Um, gangsterism is rife there now. So, you know, I, I'm very fortunate to have, have come out of that. And, um, I, I believe it's, it's largely thanks to my parents, thanks to Dane as well for, for what he's achieved in football. Um, and yeah, I went to school, went to primary school in, in Kobecha, uh, Greenwood primary. And then we moved to Johannesburg in 2005, mm. uh, which was a few months after Dane made his professional debut in the PSL. Mm. And we moved up because, you know, as a family, we 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 thought it, it's best if we uh, to support him in, in his career because he'd, he'd been living here since 1999 at the School of Excellence. So uh, we moved up to support him. I finished my schooling here. Um, and that's how I got into football and, and into football journalism specifically. Okay, so um, growing up in in a township because we all know like, okay, yeah, but this isn't about me. But also grew up in a township. How, you know, in a township, obviously, it's almost like any place. There are like good parts and obviously the bad parts of a township. So uh, where did you grow up, and how uh, was the gangsterism rife when you were still there, or is it only now? Uh, look, it, it it was obviously present at the time, um, but it wasn't as rife as it is now. I mean, uh, modern tactics is for, for, you know, gangsters to influence, you know, youngsters from 12, 13 years old. Uh, and that's that's actually where the problem is today. Is it's so rife because more 12-year-olds, 13-year-olds are dropping out of school, going into gangsterism because they're living in, in poverty and, and, you know, gangsters are offering them, you know, Money. nice shoes, nice clothes uh, to do their little errands and, and you know, get up to mischievous things. So um, back then it wasn't as as uh, prevalent as, as now. Um, but of course, we knew about it. We heard about it. It just wasn't, you know, as obvious as, as what they do now. I mean, you, you can, any time of day, you'd hear gunshots to, going off now and, and you'd be wondering, oh, I wonder who got shot now. Whereas back then, it was, you know, under the radar. You don't see much of it, and there was less gun uh, guns involved. It, it was more stabbings and stuff like that. So, mm. um, for me, it wasn't. I was fortunate that that you know I I didn't get caught up into it. I didn't get um, I didn't experience anything you know, amongst my friends or anything. Um, but of course, living in 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 a township is you know you come across uh, some of of you know the bad guys who who wanna try and, you know, rob you or, you mm. know, they just try and influence you negatively and stuff. Um, and I was just fortunate that, you know, I, I managed to avoid that. I had good friends that kept me away from from the bad people. And, and you know, we we looked out for each other all, always. Uh, if, if we were to get up to mischief, it was together <laughs> as a group. And if we were, if we escape, we escape together. So we don't leave a man behind. And it was all, almost like our own gang. Uh, but you know, in, in a good sense, uh, you know how it goes. I mean, 
every you you grow up and you're like ah oh, this is our gang no one messes with my friend <laughs> if you mess with him you mess with me you know we stand up for each other but at the same time if we get up to mischief we don't leave anyone behind to to get into trouble so um i was fortunate to to escape that i think in the last 10 years or so it, it's really gone bad it's gone south um and yeah I, um i haven't been involved or you know i haven't been home much even uh, over the last 10 years because i've been so busy in, w- with work and stuff like that it, it's not very it's not easy to to travel and and just enjoy downtime because football is is 24/7 so mm. um yeah this it it's sad to us this but do you think that uh, now uh, especially with the stigma especially around colored people and um so so called uh, gangsterism that the place that you used to love and uh, the place that you used to call home is now your typical uh, colored community yeah it, it is very sad uh, look I, i'm sure some people would say it was that typical colored community back in the day but as a youngster you know i wasn't exposed to to what's obviously happening now out in the light and um mm. for me it was that was my safe haven i mean even though it was a township it mm. it was home for me i felt safe there i felt secure um if if i i got lost in another place i would have felt more insecure than than i would have in my own uh, hood so mm. to speak so um i i do feel like you know it's it's always been um perceived as as you know this rough place but um i think it's it's yeah it's it's sad how how things have changed um you know especially now with with social media and all that because uh back then you were a gangster you, you were a gangster under the radar now mm. it's like you're a gangster and you want to flaunt it on on social media so everyone knows who's the gangster and, and who's who's you know do getting up to mischief because they're flashing all their fancy things and this one is posting of their guns and all that and uh it it's it's incredibly sad and and it doesn't help that stigma of course um because uh up until today you know we still colors are still seen as you know that guy who's going to stab you or that guy who's going to shoot you or whatever the case is i mean doesn't matter what what background you come from uh you can come from a privileged background and just because you colored people automatically you know uh, stigmatize uh, what what your background is and and where you come from and what you, you your potential is um in a sense and it's funny it's actually prevalent in the work workspace as well i mean i haven't experienced that myself but i've heard you know sometimes colored people are, are looked down on because of their accents or because of where they come from because simply because they colored and and you know if it's a if it's a job where where trust is a big thing uh often times they they turn away from hiring a colored because they think uh, maybe this one will will you know turn on us and and you'll rob us or something like that uh, that's very um that that's very enlightening uh i didn't know that uh it was uh it's also prevalent in the workspace or in the workplace environment so now moving on in 2005 you guys moved to uh johannesburg right So now how do you start uh, getting involved into football writing or report in reporting specifically? So 2005 I was still a kid I was 13 years old. Um I was in school I just started high school in my first year of high school was was in Kabecha and then we moved up and I I was in grade 9 at uh, Foy's high school. Um it was actually it was very sad for me because I left a you know a solid footballing background in in Kabecha in in Galvendale um and my school was i mean i was i was being taught course at at school i was doing football i was doing whatever i wanted to do um and moving to four ways obviously you know seen as a, a model c school and um you know the white areas clubs football clubs are far, few and far between mm-hmm. so school didn't have football um and i was you know you forced to do a, one sport per term at least <laughs> so i ended up going into athletics i started doing hockey um i i even i mean i played around with rugby even my my small frame um i broke my finger in my first game um 
but yeah, it it was incredibly sad, incredibly sad because I I felt that you know I I could have actually made it in football, but um, my parents were also quite strict um, because of my brother had made it in football. You know, there was the belief that uh, lightning doesn't strike the same place twice. So I was forced to to focus on my schoolwork because my brother had made it in football. So uh, there wasn't much, you know, effort or, or resources thrown at me in terms of my aspirations as a footballer. Um, and I, I sort of phased out of it. I was a pretty decent athlete. Um, I, I, I ran provincials. Uh, and um, I got my colors at school for, for athletics as well. Uh, and then I went to UJ after school, 2010, um, studied sports development, and I continued with athletics. Um, and I just, I, I don't know if, if my hunger had died down uh, because I had been denied, you know, uh, from playing football for, for about three, four years. Mm. Uh, my hunger had died down and I was just, I became so complacent that, oh, I still have time. I can, I can go into football another time. Um, but obviously my, my parents' drive was still uh, to, to do well at school. Um, and I, I sort of, I rebelled uh, that year. Um, I, was, I was doing sports development, even though I had done, I wanted to do sports management. What's uh, the difference me. between... Um, Sports management was a BCom, which, you know, you cover financial aspects of, of sport and, and uh, you know, the background of accounting and all that comes into play. Um, but sports development was more um, human, like, you know, the human element, like anthropology, where life comes from, uh, sociology, the social ex aspects of sport. Um, and, you know, th those things didn't interest me. I, want, I wanted pure sport. I mean, I... I did human movement studies, which I loved. Um, people still ask me today, like, you know, when it comes to my family, uh, they still ask me to do massages and stuff because I studied like the human body in depth in my first year. Um, but long story short, uh, I, I didn't enjoy it. I, I failed that first year. Um, and I got obviously, you know, the, the F7, I think it was F7, uh, when they yeah. kick you out of the university for failing. Um, and then I moved on to a, a technical college called ETA, uh, based in Randburg, and I did a mm -hmm. sports management diploma. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was in my second year uh, when I, I was going to training with Dane. Uh, it, we were off, I think, that week or two um, on midterm break, and uh, I went with him to Pirates training. And the, the deputy editor at the time at kickoff was uh, Melissa Reddy. And she mm. needed a lift to pirate training because she didn't have a car yet. So um, at pirate training, she needed to do a shoot with Dane, Opa Manisa, and Benny McCarthy. I think I'm, I'm not sure if it was Opa or, or Jali. My, my memory uh, doesn't serve me well at this moment. But one of the three, uh, one of the two, but it was a, a three-person cover. And I actually helped coordinate the, the, sh the shooting, um, getting the guys together and, you know, helping her um, set everything up and all that. And on our way home, I realized that, you know what, I actually enjoy today. Uh, <laughs> and I made a joke with her and I said, don't you guys have a job for me? <laughs> and by chance, he just said, actually, we're looking for an intern. Um, if you're keen, you know, you, you can come through and, and see if you're interested uh, try it out if you don't enjoy it you obviously you're not obliged to to continue working or whatever mm -hmm. and in i mean without knowing you know I, I never imagined myself as a journalist or anything mm -hmm. and without realizing it i went took this this chance and uh, i mean i ended up where i am today nine years later so um i am i mean that was was pure fate um and, you know, I, I, I always think back and, and I, I, <clears throat> I think back with a smile because how it came about, I mean, I, I, I just never pictured myself doing this. And nine years later, I mean, I, I leave as, you know, an ambassador of, of kickoff. Many people know me as a kickoff journalist. Many people will still look at me as a kickoff journalist going forward. So I'm, I'm extremely grateful for, for that journey. 
Oh, and it's oh, it's actually a very interesting story. So it it this is all by chance, and they say if you don't uh, take your chances, <laughs> if you don't take a if you don't take chances, then you'll never. If you don't buy a ticket to the raffle, you'll never win the lotto. So you took- yeah, no, precisely. It's, it's it's very you know, and and some people think oh, it's a cliche. It doesn't really work, but I'm loving testimony to to the fact that you know. Some things happen by chance, and you know, if if you have the guts to take it, um, then you never know how things could turn out. I mean, look at me, I, I never pictured myself as a journalist, and I made my, my name as a journalist. So, um, you, you, it might not be like I said, I wanted to do sports management, I wanted to be in the business side of, of football. Mm-hmm. Um, and you'll hear many footballers speak today if you ask them, What do you want to do after football? Oh, no, I want to go into sports management. Mm-hmm. You know, it's 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 a typical choice for, for a sports person to just want to study sports management because it's the easy decision. Oh, it's sports management. I know what it's about. Um, and I ended up as a journalist. I never completed my sports management. I dropped out in my second year of my diploma because I was, I just, in, I loved my job so much that I felt like my studies were becoming a distraction. <laughs> and to my, to my parents, uh, um, you know, I don't know. They they were so angry at me because I didn't actually tell them I dropped out. I waited until the end of the year and they were waiting for my results to come. And I'm like, oh no, I dropped out of that in June already. <laughs> so they they were pretty upset because they basically wasted three years of, of uh, tuition fees and I still don't, I, I didn't get a qualification to show for it. So, uh, but yeah, that that's just the journey I've been on. I mean, uh, I've been extremely privileged to 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 travel this this long uh, on this journey and and not you know fall by the wayside because I didn't have any qualifications or anything. So uh, at the end of the day, I have a, my own family now. Uh, I have my own you know responsibilities. I have a young daughter, so it it, it just turned out great. Um, and you know, I'm sure my parents don't look back and and regret the fact that they paid uh, all that money and I still don't have a qualification. So how uh, do you become, okay, you, you become an intern, right? So from being an intern, how do you become a reporter? Because do you work hard and then they're like, okay, we're going to give you the job and then that's how it happens. And what's the difference between you being a reporter and someone being a journalist? So for uh, someone who doesn't know. Look, it's, it's obviously sometimes companies taking interns because they need it because they need, you know, junior hands and the juniors need experience. So often it's, or not often, but sometimes it's, it's not with the intention to, to offer this intern a job. Sometimes it's just giving them work experience so that uh, it boosts their CV. They can apply somewhere else and get a job. But in, in my case, it was obviously a case of, I'm an intern. I I'm loving this job. I want to learn. I want to work. Uh, and then showing that I can, you know, do the work that's that's being asked of me. Um, and fortunately, I had a mentor like Melissa Reddy, who's, who's obviously now based in England, covering the biggest uh, football tournaments in the world today. Um, she she pushed me, she encouraged me, she guided me. And, you know, naturally, because of my output and, and you know, the returns I was giving for for all the, the time and the effort she put into to sort of grooming me and mentoring me. Uh, she pushed for me to, to get a, a job. Um, and it started out as a contract uh, job. I mean, I was con- offered a one-year contract. It got extended to another year. Uh, and eventually I, I got the permanent, you know, position when, when one had opened up. So it doesn't, there's no natural progression from, from an internship unless it's, pre, uh, you know, previously communicated to you or prior communication he said that it's an intern with possibility of of getting a permanent position um but yeah I, as an intern you know you, you really have to earn your stripes you've you've not made it as an intern it's it's basically you were trialist as at a football club mm. uh, if i can put it that way uh, you, to use the football analogy uh, when you go on trial you don't score one goal uh, in training and then you think oh i've arrived <laughs> uh, you know, you, you consistently, you're there first every morning, you leave last. Um, 
and you you know you sh you show that you you want this you show that this means everything to you uh, and that's what i did and and you know luck position opened up for me and, and I got it. Uh, in, so there's a perception that, you know, of every reporter is a, is a journalist or every journalist is a reporter. But you actually get, in, in today's time specifically, you get uh, content, content producers, content managers, um, content creators, uh, there's so many, you know, diversities to, to this job these days because uh, the, the rise of social media has obviously, you know, opened up a, a specific niche uh, within the journalism space and within the reporting space. So you, you could see someone looking for a, a social media reporter or social media manager or whatever the case is. And that speaks to, you know, what they do, their specific duties and the expectations from the company. So a journalist would, would be more broad-based. You do investigative work, uh, you do uh, write-ups, you do match reports, you do interviews, you do, um, you know, all sorts of, you know, everything that entails journalism, you, you'll do that. Whereas a reporter, um, you, you're more, you know, office-based, uh, you report on, on what's being put out there. If something gets announced on social media, uh, you report on that. Uh, if there's an event and you get invited, you report on that. It's not necessarily going, you know, underground, undercover uh, to do investigative work and, and compile a whole, you know, you see journalists these days, they become authors eventually because they gather so much intel that, you know, they, they can literally put it in a, in a 300 page document and, and publish it as a, as a book. Uh, so with reporters, you, you know, you, you more busy with current affairs and all that. So they, I mean, different companies will, will also, uh, term the, the jobs differently based on, on what they expect from, from the, re the reporter or the journalist or social media manager or content producer or whatever. So I, I became a content producer because I started, uh, going, venturing into, uh, photo journalism. I, I used to take my own pictures. Um, I started doing video video interviews. When I do interviews, I don't just record on a record. I, I do videos and then I edit it. I put it up on, on YouTube and all that. So um, yeah, there's obviously now there's, there's uh, graphic designers are becoming a, a new phenomenon in, in football journalism because people want to see engaging content put out on social media. So if you have um, ability to, to do your own graphic design, that's another, you know, um, feather under your cap and, and you can actually sell yourself as as a you know as a a box to box midfielder kind of you're not you don't just defend or mm. or you just attack you you do everything so uh, that that's what one piece of advice i can give to to up and coming or aspiring journalists as well is to you know broaden your scope uh, don't just specialize in one thing try and do multiple things because you never know uh, when opportunities come and, and they're looking for something specific, but you can offer even more than what they're looking for. So uh, you obviously put yourself in an, at an advantage. So, uh, okay, now you become a reporter. So how do you become a part of SAFJA, uh, South African Journalism as a Football Associate, Journalism Association? SAFJA is, oh, man, it, it, it started as a, you know, a WhatsApp group, um, a couple of journals uh, just came together. I, I believe there's been multiple attempts in the past to, you know, to to start up a, an organization that, that uh, represents uh, football journalists and their interests. Uh, but, you know, you, you to start something like this, you need people who are passionate, people who are committed to, to serving. Um, and I believe there was just too much division previously, like, you'd get two, three, four journalists who are close together and, you know, they're going in, in, in the same direction. Uh, but to actually, uh, you know, start up an organization, you need tens, twenties, uh, over 50 people who buy into the same, uh, you know, mm -hmm. ideology that, that you, you're selling. So 
Seth just started uh, 2018 as a WhatsApp group. We just, you know, we engaged on, on football matters, what was happening, current affairs, sharing our opinions and, and debating, uh, you know, different things uh, around the game and what's been happening. And in 2020, we actually started becoming serious. Um, we put together a constitution and everything. Uh, we sold it to, to members, guys that we knew, invited them. Uh, we we literally started this thing on Zoom because of the pandemic, um, but the pandemic allowed us that time to also you know invest in in what uh, we wanted to do or what we saw Savja becoming. So it's you know that that silver lining is 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 really you know it's always there. Uh, we could have complained that our oh, COVID was killing us. We were blocked from going to PSL games, we couldn't attend um, events or anything. And our, our work really, you know, took a knock because we were, de we were becoming dependent on clubs to, to provide us with content. We couldn't go out and, and get it ourselves. So from that point, we also thought, you know what, let's start by offering our members, uh, you know, exclusive interviews. We got um, people on, on Zoom, um, I mean, one of the most prominent figures we got was was Coach Pizzo in in Egypt. Um, the late Tulani Tuswa, may his soul rest in peace, uh, did amazing to to set that up for us. And you know, we used our contacts in the industry and just to you know boost ourselves in terms of where we wanted to go. Um, eventually, we 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 partnered with Hollywood Bets um, to to set up our own awards. I mean, you see the Football Writers Association in England. Mm -hmm. Mm. Uh, they do the, the the football of the season as well. Um, and we thought, why? I mean, we see ourselves as this top league in Africa. Uh, why are we not, you know, having these things? Why don't we have a, a football journalist football of the season? Um, and yeah, Hollywood Bets came on board and, and we were obviously, we are funded in, 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 these, um, in these goals of ours and we managed to get trophies. We managed to get prize money together. And yeah, we, we kicked on like that. And I mean, now we have over 160 members uh, as Savja. Um, and we just, you know, we're we continuing to, to grow. People are expressing more interest. And we, we continue doing, you know, what, what we've set out to do, which is amazing. And it's not the, the guy, the, the few of us who started this whole thing is... We don't take credit for any of it. I mean, it, it's the work of, of everyone. It's it's us showing, you know, uh, unity as as journalists, football journalists in the country, and just coming together and supporting this thing and and helping it to grow. So hopefully, we'll we'll see it grow from strength to strength in in the future, and and more up and coming journalists will join. I mean, we we're also working on a mentorship program. Uh, we'd love to to um, help up and coming aspiring journalists. Because we were all there at one stage. I, I started as an intern. Uh, our chairman, Velenem Nyandu, started uh, back in, in uh, East London or in the Eastern Cape as, as a, a young you know, radio journalist who no one knew, community radio station. And we're fortunate actually to, to have some community radio station or mm. uh, community newspaper journalists. Uh, already as members of Savage. So uh, that just shows that, you know, we, we, we're we not discriminating or anything. We It's not for the elite of the elite. It's, it's really just open to to anyone uh, who sees uh, themselves being able to or willing to to contribute to to the growth of the association um, and, and the growth of football in our country. So now that we're actually living in a digital age, if... Because we do get this thing where journalists aren't able to, let's say, get a job or even an internship. So would would it be better for them to, let's say, start their own um, YouTube channel and start doing their own journalism then, quote unquote, actually hire themselves or um, keep on uh, what uh, keep on looking for that internship? What would be better for them? Yeah, of course, you look for for anyone to to give you a chance i mean if you're not taking an internship or if no one is offering internships um for anyone to hire you they need to see a body of work they need to see uh, your previous experience what you've previously done so it's 
it's in your best interest as an aspiring journalist to actually, you know, work up your own portfolio of work, whether you're working for yourself or for a company for as a freelancer or whatever the case is. Social media obviously gives you a, an opportunity to also uh, put your work out there and get other people critiquing your your work and and so forth. So um, there's there's definitely a space for for an aspiring journalist to build himself up on his own before he even uh, ventures into uh, publications like Kickoff or Sokola Duma or uh, Goal.com. Far Post is coming now. Desky Times. Mm-hmm. Um, the one thing is the one struggle, of course, is. Uh, to do it, you know, it must come from the right place. Mm. Uh, if you're doing it for for retweets or for likes or comments or whatever, uh, you're going to find yourself, you know, going in a, in a direction where you just start losing the plot and, and you start fabricating things because uh, you're craving the, the, the clout, so to, so to speak. So, and, and that, you know, I, I hate to touch on it, but that has really made the industry so difficult to, to, to come up uh, through with your own like even for me to start my own thing uh, credibility is, is everything in, in our industry I mean in, in media you want to work with credible people and there's so much you know these fly-by-night uh, blogs on, on social media that they just steal quotes uh, posted as their own without crediting um, and they, they start fabricating things because you know they get a kick out of getting those shares and those likes and the comments and everything's just blowing up. They, they post go viral, even though it's fake news. And sometimes fans are, are gullible enough to, you know, actually to entertain it and, and believe it. And uh, it becomes so difficult because now how do you, you separate, you know, the real ones from the fake ones? Uh, if you have 200 followers mm. and you, you've you got, you know, original content, mm. uh, people start measuring you as like, oh, you, you you nobody, you you don't have credible information because you only have two hundred followers. Whereas the guys who, who are building their pages with fifteen thousand followers uh, and tweeting fake things are now seen as credible sources because of the amount of followers and and stuff. So it, it's sad. I mean, it's it's very sad. It, it makes it so much tougher for for aspiring journals and, and up and coming journals to to actually you know try and work on their craft and develop themselves uh, for when that opportunity comes. Uh, but my my advice is just to you know stick at it, keep keep your 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 head in the right space, uh, do it for the right reasons, and and just follow your passion, man. It's it's it, it's it's gonna be long. It's gonna take many hours of your time, mm-hmm. and you're gonna get frustrated. But you need to keep at it, and and the right people will will come across your page or or your work and and give you that opportunity you you so desire. And uh, speaking on that, um, the sun uh, in England, you have the sun, uh, you have the mirror, the mirror. You have so many unreliable sources, and even Sky, a lot of the times, is very unreliable. A lot of uh, English journalists actually do uh, a lot of things for clout, because now yeah, no. uh, you have a few people that people trust. Let's say your David Ornstein and your Fabrizio Romano. Yeah, it's. The, the market becomes even more difficult when when there are you know so many different sources of information as you've mentioned i mean there's the guardian there's the telegraph there's the uk literally has over 100 uh, publications that people can choose from for their information and uh, at the end of the day you know sometimes the pressure gets so much because people aren't uh, and this thing is a beast and the more you feed it, the more it wants. So uh, if, if you're breaking news the one week <laughs> or the one month and you've got 50 stories that, that you've broken, people are rushing to your website or to your page to see what's happening. Uh, and the next month you have nothing. Then people obviously stop coming back and, and you lose engagement, you lose readership, everything. And then that temptation kicks in to say, hey, I need to start writing something just to get the people coming back. So uh, you you become a bit unethical and and you just you you chasing you know that that kick of of having readers or engagement or whatever um, coming to your page or to your website and whatever. And that temptation is there is always going to be there. Uh, whether you are Sky Sports, whether you are Kickoff, whether you are Soccer Laduma. Um, 
but it's it's you know it's it's for you to to remain ethical keep your integrity um the right stories will eventually find you uh, and you'll be known for you know for having kept your integrity and, and your ethics and all that uh, without having to to compromise your your reputation uh, and that's the other thing once once you compromise your reputation once uh, i mean who's going to trust you again it's it's <laughs> It's a stain on on your CV. It's a stain on your reputation that that you just can't rid yourself of, no matter how much you change. So, uh, the best thing is to just you know steer clear, rather accept the dip in in readership or engagement or whatever the case is uh, that you're measuring yourself by, mm. and you know use that time to to get the the proper information, to get um, credible sources and all that, and and just build yourself up. So. It, it's once once there is you know hundreds of other websites mm. it's it becomes a difficult market and you know it's hard to to differentiate yourself from the other one and and that's when you need to you know keep keep strong and, and just work hard and your hard work will eventually pay off so so yeah it's 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 very difficult in this space it's it's nothing it's it's nothing compared to what people see on the outside and criticize you for because mm. Uh, when you're quiet and there's nothing happening, it's not because you're not working. It's because you know you're not you're not ready to put credible information out there. So you'd rather hold back and and you know people can criticize and say, ah, uh, this one is breaking the story, but uh, Kickoff hasn't reported anything. That's because Kickoff don't you know have information credible enough to put out there that you can trust and rely on. So uh, instead of criticizing, just be patient and uh, yes, that one is running with the story, but uh, what if that whatever that one says doesn't come to, to fruition and then what happens then uh, you're going to forget that you were criticizing kickoff who's going to give you the facts of the story eventually uh, and and the one that you were running after because they broke the story uh, got it wrong and then it's it's nothing it blows over like it's like it like nothing happened so um yeah it's just, it's just to to keep working and, and you know respect the respect the craft and and you know eventually your, your time will come but sometimes uh, a lot of people uh, struggle with actually biding their time because sometimes um, you might be passionate about something, but sometimes you might be poor and you're like, I got to get this. You see, I, I've got to get this now. And they uh, forget yeah. about the entire process because with everything, there's a process. You, you've you got to put in that 10,000 hours of, of working. 100%. 100%. Yeah, it's it, and it it becomes difficult. I can understand. Well, I can imagine, uh, you know, as as a freelancer, when you know you depend on stories because you need to get paid per story or whatever the case is, and when you when you're struggling financially and you're not getting those stories, it naturally it becomes you know the pressure becomes high and you know your mind starts racing and and you start thinking oh, maybe I should compromise myself just a little bit just this once. But you know, you could get that paycheck now for for the story you compromised yourself with. But what happens to the one after that, and and you know, the next month and the month after that? Because once you stay in your reputation, hey, this industry is 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 tough. And if if it swallows you, it will spit you right out. And trying to get back in is is even harder. So rather, you know, struggle. Love below your means is, is what I always say. You know, it's it's not to once you get once you're doing well and you're getting paid well, uh, don't don't love beyond your means. Don't uh, you know start living fleshy lives and when you know that that next paycheck is not guaranteed. So uh, rather you know love modestly and and you know respect your craft and just work. And when things go well, they'll go well. If when things get tough. Even the best journalists, even your Fabrizio Romano will struggle at some point for mm. for content. So uh, you will see its transfer window now is booming. Yeah. But what happens during the season? Then he goes quiet. So he, but he knows his time will come again. He's, he's a specialist with transfer news. The transfer season must come come again and that's when he'll boom again. And he, he still makes, uh, he has his podcast where he does things uh in between uh what's this uh between the transfer windows where you know there's still a few a, 
a bit of transfer news because Sumari, yeah. they, Leicester signed Sumari about in March or something and he reported it back mm. then. If I'm not mistaken, it was in March or April. That was way before yeah. that it, it, it was done. It yeah. was open. Yeah, but he doesn't, you know, he doesn't put unnecessary rumors in the podcast <laughs> just so that he can get listeners and, mm. and stuff flocking to his podcast. He's, he speaks openly, but he knows, you know, it's not it's not the platform to to break the news oh, it's not the time to break the news so when the news is there it will be broken on on the correct platform and at the correct time so do you think uh you guys as south african football journalists have how can i put this um okay a lot of people actually mm, complain about um uh that now, we've been changing coaches, especially at Safa, uh, for a very long time. We've changed, I don't know how many coaches, and still with the same uh, head office, right? Basically, most mostly still the same uh, head office up top. So um, do you think that you guys uh, have actually written enough stories or have actually put out enough pressure, you guys as the media and journalists as well, uh, on the guys above because they're not uh, reaching their targets that they've set for themselves and yet they keep on firing these coaches whereas in rugby it's not the same thing if you're not performing as the president you get shipped out in South Africa it, it seems to be like a, a, there's someone uh, certain people are holding on to their jobs <laughs> for way too long and without producing yeah, no, that. Look, that's it, it's it's a bit like COVID. You you can't you just can't get rid of it, even if you you come up with your own vaccine and stuff. Um, but it's you know you can put pressure to a certain extent, hmm. um, but but if the person is not willing and if the person doesn't have you know self respect or or you know integrity and you know has that accountability within themselves to to realize that you know what it's better I walk away. Then there's very little we can do as the media. I mean, uh, you'll see in, in political journalism, people can write <laughs> damning um, uh, facts and allegations against presidents or ministers and whatever. Those people don't, you know, they have no skin on their backs. So they're not going to say, ah, let me step down because so-and-so has been exposed. I mean, you look in the UK and I, and I alluded to this a few weeks ago, uh, the, the health secretary got caught on camera cheating with, with yeah. one of his uh, colleagues in the office <laughs> and, he, and he resigned. I mean, you'll never see that Yeah, People break COVID lockdown and loot the, the money like there's no tomorrow <laughs> and no one resigns. There's no action. So, it, so it's a South African problem. It's a South African epidemic actually that, you know, people lack accountability and uh, you can say what you want. People are not going to just walk out of a position because uh, they too comfortable there. Um, it's it's cozy there. No one can force them out because unless you use force, uh, and and to some extent that can't even work because you can go and protest at the union buildings. You're not going to get the president to say okay, I step down, unless you actually threaten him. But then there's criminal charges against you. For, for threatening a, a president or, or uh, another person. So uh, as football media, it, it's a similar case. You know, we can put pressure, but if, if the person in, in power or the person in that position has no self, you know, respect and, and no integrity, no accountability, then they're going to choose to just stay in, in that position of power because they're comfortable. So um, we, as journalists, we can put facts we can put i mean there was allegations of rape serious allegations of rape and just you know no one internally even put pressure for for anyone to to take action or to suspend anyone or, or anything like that so it's just it, it's really a, it's a big problem and it's sometimes it's it's beyond your control as as a journalist you need you require like you know armed forces to go in there and, and you know, demand action or, or demand change. Um, and it's a pity because, um, you know, and, and I'm not character assassinating anyone mm. or anything like that, but 
uh, some of the people in our football, you know, you have no, they have no backbone. They're not there for for the love of the game, for 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 football development. They're there for uh, to line their pockets. They're there to to you know serve their own interests, and and it's it's just so sad. And more than more than that, it it sets a precedent because eventually, when that person steps down or leaves, what do you expect the next generation to do? They've been starved of opportunities for so long. Of course, they're going to go into those positions and do the exact same thing, line their own pockets, mm. go in there with self-interest. And it just creates a snowball effect. And I, I, it's it's beyond me how people don't see it that are in those positions of power to say, you know what, let me step down. Let me do the honorable thing. Step down, step aside and let, let someone else lead this association for the greater good of, of the game. What do you think are the problems in South African football where we have not actually reached the heights that we that, that we as a nation are we're supposed to reach or are, are we as ourselves expect to reach? Self-interest. Very simple. Um, whether it's in you know in in the boardrooms or on the pitch, um, there's there's many agendas in this game. Um, Sometimes, you know, people take uh, PSL jobs just to, to make money. It's like, oh, I've been waiting for this opportunity. I want, I want this money. And they'll overlook the development of the game. Why do we have uh, 24-year-olds being called youngsters making their PSL debuts? <laughs> That's self-interest. People aren't, aren't thinking of, of the future. They're not thinking of the greater good of, of South African football. Uh, they're looking at 18-year-olds and saying, ah, oh, it's not ready, it's not ready. Um, and at the same time, down at the bottom of the pipeline, you have coaches that are, you know, cutting corners in, in development. Uh, some of them are, you know, if the spotlight's not on them, uh, they could be playing, you know, people, kids they know. It's, it's not like they're ve- developing talent because there's potential there. They're developing talent or they, they're giving opportunities to people they know, like, oh, come bring your son, um, you know, we'll sort, we'll sort him out if you sort me out on, on, on a business mm-hmm. front because let's be honest, I mean, amateur coaches are not, they, they don't get paid well. They don't, they're not in a, in, in a structured environment where they can say I'm, I'm an amateur coach, I'm, I'm a development coach. They all have side jobs and then the coaching is, on, is done on the side. So uh, where there's opportunity to, you know, line your pockets, why not use that opportunity? And that, that's the approach, you know, many of our development coaches uh, take because uh, if we were, you know, genuine about this thing, then uh, we'd have, I mean, we have incredible talent in our country. We, we can't deny it. with a population of 60 million. You can't tell me we can't put the 11 players on the, on the field to go and win AFCON, mm. uh, let alone struggle to qualify. <laughs> uh, you know what I'm saying? Mm. So even in the PSL, you see so many players uh, come... They taken from you know from the streets uh, to play in professional ranks. Mm. They haven't come through a structured development. Mm. That club itself uh, has a structured development, but you don't see the pipeline coming through. People aren't readily promoted and, and given opportunities. They'd rather sign a player that that made you know that performed well in one season at another club, uh, mm. without considering their background. That you know what, this guy is a short term solution. He had no development. He had a great season last season, but you know he he wasn't taught the the fundamentals of football. He still has you know that street football mentality of trapping the ball with his studs. His first touch is poor. Uh, he doesn't look up when he crosses the ball. You know, there's so many technical aspects that get overlooked in in our football, all because one player does well in one season or in a couple of games, and then there's some hype around him. And, oh, let's sign that one. <laughs> So uh, it's strange that I, I was actually speaking to Ethan what I think two weeks back, Ethan Brooks, and he yeah. said he never went to uh through development. And I said to him, uh, that's actually a blessing in disguise because had he gone to let's say your vits or your sundowns, he would have still been on the bench. And yet he went on, he played uh organ, he was playing organized football, and then he was scouted yeah. at the engine uh, by Dan, engine cup by Dan and then that's how things happen I said that that was a blessing in disguise for him and yeah you you obviously get you know the rare talents that 
that were you know natural natural talent and mm. that uh, rough diamond uh, but for you to win the world cup you're not going to have 11 ethan brooks you know what i'm saying <laughs> yeah. uh, you need you need an ethan brooks to be complemented by by five six seven other you know players that have been polished to to withstand pressure to withstand you know the, the technical uh, basics that's that's needed at, at mm. that high level uh, and then you you might get an ethan brooks who, who will use his natural talent and score you that with that winning goal that takes you to the final of the world cup or something like that uh, but very rarely you'll, you'll find a team that uses 11 rough diamonds uh, <laughs> based on natural talent and and they'll succeed in anything uh, your germany your spain They all develop their teams, their World Cup winning teams over a period of 10 years coming to the next season, and, and that's it. And uh, uh, oh, and then another one, uh, uh, Pepe Lossi told is uh, another one he's linked uh, with what's this Liel right now so uh, we'll see about him uh, because Liel hey, they have they have a good uh, scouting network but um, and I, one thing that I wanted to uh, a few things that I actually wanted to speak to you about is um, where did in 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 your in football journalism football journalism circles uh, what do you guys think about the World Cup money that for development that all of a sudden disappeared because we haven't seen that money being used anywhere? Literally, I have like I have not like FIFA gave us money. I have not seen that money being put to good use, just from my perspective and my opinion. And the PSL disciplinary committee because this is not the first time that we're having a situation like this. Remember uh, with Pirates and Sundowns when Arons uh, was. Uh, What's this played when he wasn't supposed to be playing and sundowns were actually supposed to be docked points but they didn't dock them points because it would mm. seem uh unscrupulous because pirates have their chairman uh up at psl yeah um the first one on, on the world cup uh, legacy trust um there's soft claim obviously in, in their books to to still have money in that account <laughs> Um, it's been it's been said that you know that money's been used for other things. Uh, it's it's being poured into uh, Fun Valley, uh, this technical yeah. center that we've heard about for the last five years. But you know, not, nothing's really happening around it. Bafana still uh, go to to uh, top hotels, uh, Hilton hotels, and uh, train at uh, arbitrary facilities. Um, Orlando Stadium, UJ Stadium, Bafana's all over the place. They don't have a base, and yet for the past five years, there's been talk of this technical center that you know we never get to see. It gets promoted every now and then uh, for for junior national teams, or even Banyana was based there the other day. Uh, but there's no, there's they haven't even had an, an opening ceremony of this technical center to actually invite the media and show them what they've achieved in the last five years. Um, so look, without evidence, I'd, I'd be compromising myself here by mm. saying, yeah, this and this has, has been stolen and, and uh, this, the funds was used for this or was taken by that. Um, so on that one, <laughs> it's only Safa who can answer that question. Uh, there's talk of, of the association cooking their books uh, <laughs> when it comes to you know, the financial auditing. Uh, there was that big scandal with KPMG uh, a, f- a few years ago as well. Um, so I think um, there's, you know, on that one, the only qu- people who can actually answer is suffer themselves. And um, if, if we require evidence, uh, we need to request this evidence. Um, and that's how we'll, you know, we'll, we'll find the, you'll have to follow the crumbs and, and find the bread yourself. Uh, so, with a PSL one, um, and I think it's been touched on a few times, uh, the need for, for an independent uh, executive committee is, is greater now than ever because 
these things are becoming regular occurrences. Um, you know, people are finding loopholes in, in the rules. Uh, you know, there's governance issues of, of the league not taking sufficient action against people. Uh, there's literally a, a rule in the in the NSL handbook that prohibits clubs from going to to the courts, uh, and yet every season for the last three seasons, people have gone to courts, mm. uh, and you know there's there's no retrospective action taken on 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 those clubs, uh, and the courts are obeyed. I mean, by law they have to be obeyed at the end of the day, but at the end of the day, they should never be able. They should never reach the courts if. If what what was being done internally was was settling matters uh, amicably, so I think uh, it's definitely time. I mean, uh, we've seen uh, the PSL chairman go unopposed for for a number of of terms now. Um, I've I've lost count of how many terms he's he's been uh, the PSL chairman. So and we all know. I mean, it's no secret that you know uh, age age catches up eventually. You can be a, a brilliant administrator, uh, but when age catches up, you know your mind wanders. Uh, you just—it's not you're not the same person you were uh, when you went in, when you were in your prime. Um, the the players we see today, uh, I mean, it, they're not going to be the same players in five, ten years' time. So why is it different with with administrators? Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it's definitely. I'd I'd put my hand up and say you know what, this is the time for for us to get an independent exco. You'll still have obviously the board of governors, who, which is the main decision making uh, body, uh, and the club members have a say there. But at least the executive committee will, will take the the running of the league uh, independently, uh, is what we we need to see, uh, and it will it it's good for for the public for the PSL's uh, in public image as well because. I mean, how many years have we had to deal with people saying, yeah, uh, <laughs> the chairman is, is chairman of a club uh, and he takes decisions to favor his club uh, and uh, the acting CEO for the last uh, five years uh, is a chairman of a club. She takes decisions that favor her club. Um, and it's just, you know, it's endless. Uh, it's a PR nightmare, to be honest. Mm. Uh, to be working in, in that PR department at the PSL is is one of the toughest jobs because you're always under scrutiny and, you know, it's, it's just unpleasant to, to try and, uh, you know, defend against these allegations and uh, these rumors and accusations uh, that it's, it's not even, they've even stopped defending it because, you know, <laughs> it's now it's just, you know, like it's conspiracy. Uh, but when the real issue is actually, if there was an independent body that, that was running the league, then you you wouldn't have anything. Our Im- the league's image would be spotless. There wouldn't be any you know outstanding cases come the end of the season. Uh, and and our prosecutor, let's be honest, has has been really useless because <laughs> you can't wait two three months uh, to investigate a matter in football, which changes every week. There's fixtures mm. literally every week, and you waiting two three months uh, to look back at at cases that was you know where disputes were were lodged and, and so forth. Uh, and then if they take it on appeal, then it then you start appealing yourself because uh, the rules are so, you know, ambiguous that uh, it's so open to misinterpretation and and it just causes a whole lot of confusion and it's it's a it's a mess, honestly. And as a journalist, to be honest with you, it gets tiring writing about the same things over and over uh, and nothing changes. It it's like we know the problem, but let's not look at solutions. Let's just continue and hopefully next season it won't happen again. So, yeah, as a journalist myself, I'm, I'm tired of, of writing about these issues. And it's strange that we keep on having these same issues and it's with the same people. It, it, it's kind of, it's not strange, but when uh, will they move out so that we can usher in a new generation? Because one of the things reportedly that stopped them from getting Benny McCarthy in as the head coach was because he wanted his two assistants to be there. He didn't want Safa to choose his two assistants. Yeah, I mean, it's it's 
the mentality is it goes back to what I said earlier. You know, uh, sometimes it's it's just self interest. Uh, we'd rather if if Benny comes and brings his own people. Uh, what does it mean for you know our people that we've hired previously, mm-hmm. the contracts we've signed with him? Uh, we we don't have all that money to to pay this guy, but also when let's give Benny the job, but if he brings his assistants, we then have to fire three people instead of one. You know, it's 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 the way they look at it. It's so skewed, and and it it just it's to the detriment of the game rather than uh, you know just sacrificing their own pride and and their own egos and all that and just doing things the right way because we know what works we've seen what works uh, internationally so if if you're not you know doing things by international best practice then why are you doing things you, you want to prove that oh not everything has to be done the way you see in England where they're the number one league in the world or the way you see at FIFA uh, you know, the world governing body of, of football, uh, those guys are doing it wrong. We'll show you that we can do it and, and make a success of it. Or, or maybe they just don't want success. Like we, we don't know. We, we'll never know. So uh, un, until we see that changing and, and that uh, mentality changing, then I don't know if, you know, I, I hope our generation or, or even the next generation gets to witness, uh, you know, the real fruits of, of good governance and and good leadership in, in our football. Uh, it's been, uh, we've had a very, uh, what has been a, it's been kind of a downer, <laughs> especially yeah. towards the end, yeah. because these are some of the things that I've spoken about at length in my podcast, but they get boring. Like in my podcast, I don't like repeating certain stories. It kind of gets older. And I understand where you come from in terms of repeating yourself. So, um, transfer news. Uh, Orlando Pirates have actually signed four players. It's what Goodman, Mosele, uh, Kwanda Ngonyama. I forgot the other two. To be honest, uh, <laughs> yeah. um, I've also. Um, it's not at the. It's at the tip of my tongue. I just. I can't remember now. Um, but yeah, it's. Look. They signed, I think it was 11 players, 9 or 11 players last season. Um, And, you know, it it looks like another one of those things where um, the Pirates are just going to be signing and then uh, they take a sif um, out and and say, you know what, these are the the best ones, let's play them. The rest, you'll, you'll sit on the stands. Um, I mean, look look at Austin Moore was signed uh, and, and still hasn't got much game time. He hasn't broken into the team. So, it, you know, it, it's like they're shooting from the hip. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it's just a case of let's see who works and mm. who doesn't work out and then we'll take it from the... There's no, you know, st- sort of clear structure to say, look, let's sign four youngsters and build them up to see, you know, in, in the next two or three years, see where they take us. Um, Goodman Mosele is obviously hot right now. Kwandam um, Gunyama, uh, former Sundowns uh, defender, he, he didn't cut it at Sundowns. Uh, so I'm not sure, you know, what Pirates see in, in, in a 27-year-old Kwanda. Uh, of course, he's much younger than than what they have now in in Happy Jail and and Tyson Shatrayo. Uh So, what happens then to to Justice Chabalala? Everyone has been asking. Uh, <laughs> uh, they've they've Tabangunare. You know, so, from that sense, at least I understand that you know that's actually a succession plan. Uh, that that pirates have got there uh, with Mosele, but then again, the guy has been playing for the last two three seasons consistently. Um, what what's going to happen to him now at Pirates? Is is he going to stagnate? Is are they going to loan him out to to get game time, or, or are they actually going to throw him in the deep end to see uh, if he has what it takes to to play for Orlando Pirates? In my opinion, Ben is actually better than Monari, but anyway, because I think 
from what I've seen, Monare can't run the midfield all on his own as a linchpin, and Orlando Pirates plays a 4-3-3, and they were more organized, especially under Micho. But yeah, moving on. Oh, what do you think of uh, Pirates? Uh, okay, um, these are the three transfers there. Uh, because now, uh, evidence, what do you think of him and Baraka are kind of, it's either he'll go to Pirates, that's what's being reported, or he'll go overseas because they're kind of waiting for what he does in the Olympics. And the same goes for Tebo Mokwen. With Sipon Bule, less, less as much, but yeah. But those who are actually going to Kaiser Chiefs, it's reported that they're going to Kaiser Chiefs. Yeah, look, it's um, Mahopa is is a he's he's done well for himself. He's he's obviously you know the hype man now. He's he's up and coming. Also, twenty one years old, uh, PSL young player of the season. So naturally, there'll there'll be you know attention around him. There'll be interest uh, in him um, locally. We've reported both Orlando Pirates and Mamelodi Sundowns uh, after him, um, and then we obviously we've heard that uh, a couple of Euro- European teams have, have also expressed their interest. Um, for Barocca, I, I think it's they in a situation where you know it's much harder to keep uh, an evidence Mahopa um, on your books when when interest is is at its peak, um, and. There's there's a lot of risk actually to you know turning down this interest and in, and just keeping the player another season, especially for a club like Barok injured next season and then he loses his value. So from that perspective, I I think you know cashing in is is probably you know the best thing for for the club. Um, whereas for the player. Uh, shipping him out to to pirates or, or sundowns uh, could actually be you know not yeah. that great for him because the level of competition is is high there uh, the expectations are massive um, from the fans um, and I mean we we've, we've seen it countless times our young players you know they, they crack under pressure at, at these big clubs so uh, personally I, I think the best thing for him is is actually to move to Europe where he can, you know, develop himself for the next two, three years, sit on the bench, uh, maybe go out on loan for a season, get a feel for Europe, and then, you know, hit back and, and you know, you the next big thing on, on the European stage at 24, 25, which is ideal for, for you know, many players eating the peak of, of their careers. Um, whereas, you know, once he moves to Chiefs Pirates, we know the export rate at, at those clubs. I mean, Chiefs or, or uh, Pirates or Sundowns, apologies. Mm-hmm. Uh, we know the export rate of, of those clubs uh, and, and the success rate of those exports are, are very rare. I mean, mm-hmm. we see Percy Tau now doing uh, well for himself in, in England, uh, not quite reach the heights that, that you know we expected of him quite yet because he went on loan. Uh, Bongani Zungus, uh, you, you could say sort of stagnated a bit because of... Mm-hmm. Uh, his situation in France, going on loan in in Scotland, and now again, you know, having uncertainty on his future. Um, who else is there? I mean, there's, yeah, there's been a couple going, of guys. Yeah, Jali moving from Jali Paris. going over, coming back, mm. you coming back to to uh, South Africa again. So, um, I mean, look at uh, Pagamani Mashambi, and you know, I'm not saying it, it's the club's fault um, that these players haven't done well, but. Uh, there's there's a trend and and it could be a psychological thing for these players uh, leaving Sundowns or, or Pirates or Chiefs and not being able to cut it in Europe. So um, it it's something that that needs to be addressed and, and something that the players need to consider themselves uh, when uh, when presented with opportunities to either go to Europe or go to Sundowns or Pirates. Because at the end of the day, you can always come back to Sundowns, Chiefs or Pirates if you've been in mm-hmm. Europe for four or five years. Um, so that that's, you know, something I'd, I'd love for, for evidence. I'd love to see him in Europe uh, and, and, you know, developing himself further there on the international stage because at the end of the day, it's it'll be good for, for Bafana Bafana as well. Yeah. Um, what's the other one you mentioned? I said him, I said Sipom Bule and 
especially the oh, more the more is yeah. uh, they're waiting for the these olympic games to also see if he plays well but he'll be it's reported that he'll move to chiefs with sipon bullets kind of chiefs he'll kind of move to chiefs mm. that's what's being reported look that that vision or or that goal is is flawed in itself i mean you don't sell a player in 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 an olympic games uh, people would have need, needed to take notice of that player long before. And the Olympic Games should be something where, you know, you strike a deal for, for 15 million or you strike a deal for 50 million. So it, it's not a thing of, oh, let's send him to the Olympics and let's see which teams send offers after the Olympics. Uh, play, teams in Europe are not that short-sighted either. If they're going to sign a player, uh, they start scouting him a season in advance. So if a, if a European team sees Sipo Mbule or Taboko Mokwene at, at the Olympic Games uh, in July, um, they're not going to sign him for, for July, August or the 2021-2022 season. Uh, if they are interested, they're going to want to sign him for 2022-2023 season. Um, and they'll send scouts to monitor him, you know, year in the PSL in the 2021-2022 season. So that in itself is, you know, is heavily flawed. Uh, saying, oh, we haven't sold him yet. Uh, we're going to see after the Olympic Games what happens. Um, I mean, if if you're going to think of it like that, then give the guys new deals, improve their salary uh, at least enough for, for it to, to compete with, with what they would have earned uh, at the Chiefs, Pirates or Sundowns so that, you know, they are comfortable, but they continue working knowing that, you know, uh, next season, could be your your time to move if no european offers come by next season june uh, then you can choose between chiefs pirates sundowns whoever you know makes the right offer um but their age is also not not you know not really on their side in terms of going abroad and, and still developing uh, i think it's it's like 23 24 now uh, which as i mentioned just now i mean that's approaching their primes uh, so they should ideally be going to Europe and establishing themselves in, in, a, in a European team where they're playing every game uh, at least 40, 50, 60 minutes um, in their first season instead of going there and, and sitting on the bench for a season or being loaned out and then coming back when they're 27, 28. It, it just won't work. So um, that that vision of you know seeing after the Olympics is is heavily flawed for me. And, and I think uh, we, we will probably see Sipo Mbul and, and Taboho Mokwena in the PSL next season. It's just a case of, you know, which, which team's colours are, are they going to be wearing? Yeah. And uh, finally, we, we'll move on to KZ Chiefs transfer news because hey, they've been they've been working really hard because uh, not just with uh, Sekhota, Khaukhelo Sekhota, uh, they've also been working on, they're trying to get a left back and uh, Bloemfontein Celtics left back, I, I actually forgot his name, but that's the one that they're touting and uh, another European uh, guy, is he European? But I don't remember who he is, but they they kind of also scouting and then they've signed Khaukhelo Sekhota in Jabulong Ngobo and what are your thoughts on giving Tibedi uh, him returning to Kaiser Chiefs because a lot of people are still unsure about him actually what what is he going to do is he going to go back to uh, Kaiser Chiefs or is he going to stay at uh, Swallows because they now Chiefs are offering I think Zulu and Zuma yeah that that's who they were offering yeah. in a kind of a swap deal yeah. but we don't know about given Tibedi yeah, so based based on on what what we know, what we've reported on at, at kickoff, um, it's you know the situation at Chiefs is is heavily dependent now on on Stuart Baxter. Uh, all those plans, all those transfer links uh, that that were mentioned, um, you know, towards towards the end of last season, um, is is now they've literally all been thrown into doubt. Uh, I can tell you that you know some players uh, agreed on on contracts and everything. Uh, they were meant to join, and the club the club has called called them in now or called their clubs and said, "Listen, uh, we're no longer interested in this player. He's not going to fit the 
the, the club's plans, uh, can we please, you know, uh, cancel this deal? Um, and deals are getting, you know, cancelled and, and players are now uncertain of whether they're going to Chiefs. Am I still going to Chiefs? Am I not going to Chiefs? Uh, so there's a lot of uncertainty because of, you know, that last minute change of, of Gavin Hunt leaving and, and Stuart Baxter returning. Uh, we know Stuart Baxter is, is obviously, uh, he, he comes in with with the, the expectation of, of what he delivered the last time. And to deliver on that expectation, it's not going to be a Gavin Hunt story where, uh, oh, I'm, I'm going to play youngsters uh, because there's a transfer ban and uh, because, you know, I'm here for three years, let me just build for the three years. Baxter's mentality is going to be, the club has been going through a six-year trophy drought it's in my hands to deliver this trophy. So naturally, what is he going to do? He's going to go back to what uh, what he did before uh, with Tefu Mashamaite, um, yeah, yeah, the Shabas, uh, all the experienced guys who you know he knows what what they can can give. They've got reputations to to go back to and and say you know this is what we expect from you. You need to deliver according to the reputation you have. Um, so I feel for you know the likes of Jabulo Blom, Kosingi uh, Pilengobu. I shudder to think what's going to happen to them. Chiefs have obviously uh, been linked with Cole Alexander, another player over thirty. Um, so it, it just shows that you know pl- plans have changed so much that uh, it, it's no longer a project. It's now a win at all costs type of thing. Uh, so the, the transfer targets have, have changed drastically. Uh, the experienced players who we all thought, you know, uh, this could be the end of, of an era for Chiefs. Mm. Uh, they now back in the reckoning, they, they could, they've been, <laughs> ban- they've been handed one year deals to, to see out the next season. And uh, I mean, who knows, they do well next season or, or, the, chief, or the team wins a trophy next season. Then they get another uh, contract extension for a further season. So uh, it, it's it's actually a, a mess um, at with what's going on at Chiefs at the moment, uh, and it it's anyone's guess as to you know who's going to come in and who's going to go out there because um, yeah, with with given as well, uh, you know there's a, a lot of hype around him. He, he's done well for Swallows, especially. Uh, when they won promotion two seasons ago, um, and personally, I think he'd, he'd complement, uh, you know, you know, midfield three of of Njabulo Blom and Kosing Nobo and mm. and given to Bedi's, you see, I'd I'd pay money to see that midfield trio. Um, so that now also becomes a doubt. You, you know, is Baxter going to risk? Uh, three youngsters in the midfield when when he needs to to deliver a title to to Naturina. Um I mean you don't need to be a genius to say probably not. <laughs> um, so I, I feel for you know the the, the youngsters there, uh, but I I really do hope that you know they, there's at least uh, some consideration for for what they did this season and and the foundation they've laid because you don't want to just throw that away. Uh, they both have developed this past season and, and have learned a lot of lessons, especially campaigning in, in the Champions League. So uh, I, I hope that they stay. And then, I mean, obviously up front, they, they're running very thin. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what happened with the, with the European uh, link, uh, the striker that was linked to Chiefs. Uh, but I think they, I forgot his name also. I think uh, the club he was on low net have actually triggered an option to to sign him permanently. So I don't know if if they've looked at new options now. Um, but what is Baxter going to look for? Um, he previously played with an Carter, Kingston Carter, that the fans absolutely loathed. Uh, so is is he going to find himself a you know a, a modern day in Carter, uh, someone who's who's going to run ragged up front there and and provide opportunities for for Nurkovic? Is Nurkovic going to stay? Um, are they gonna, you know, consider letting him go for for a nice price and, and actually cash in on on him, uh, or are they gonna let him stay another season and potentially dip further uh, and then derive very little or even no value from him uh, in a season or two from now? Um, Castro's aging as well; he's not as mobile. Mm-hmm. Um, Parker's not even a striker anymore, uh, and as you mentioned, I mean Zuma's. 
Zuma has shown potential, but has he really shown that you know he's he's a Kaiser Chiefs player? Uh, he's battling with injuries um, psychologically. Is you know is he ready to you know lead the line at Chiefs or uh, does he feel more comfortable playing on the wing without that responsibility of scoring goals? Uh, there's there's just everything is just up in the air there, and uh, I think the 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 main thing that that needs to be decided is. Uh, will, will Chiefs win the Champions League or not? If they don't win, pressure is even higher. If they win, they obviously buy themselves time um, into next season where they, they don't have to rush to the transfer market and buy five high-profile signings to to try and win something on, on the domestic scene. Um, that's if they win the Champions League. And if they don't, then they might have to end up going into the market and, and buying six, seven, eight, you know, big signings to show their intent that, you know, next season is the last season we go, or this past season was the last season we go without, without the trophy. Yeah. And, and like, these are, this is my, this is my final, and then it will be my final question. Uh, with uh, Gavin Hunt, it was reported that, okay, from what I heard, I was speaking to a couple of Kaiser Chiefs fans and they said there was an email that was being sent around and, it said Baxter said, you know what? This these old guys, yeah, this is not gonna happen uh, next season. So from now on, I'll just play youth. And that was uh, apparently or reportedly that was one of the main deciding factors in him getting fired because they were like, oh, you lost uh, all these uh, old guys, and he was trying to build something uh, for the future. Where he was saying, yeah, I'm tired of this old guard. And we need something new here at Chiefs. We need a new project. And don't you find it strange that, uh, because, you know, uh, remember, Mauricio Pochettino, he had a clause in his contract when he was fired as Tottenham head coach, right? Uh, that if he finds a job, then Tottenham shouldn't give him a payoff. Do you find it strange that uh, Molife Nzeki was fired and then apparently he was going to be given or reportedly he was going to become uh, an assistant coach. Then that didn't pan out. And then all of a sudden he lands at Chiefs within a month so that they don't actually, I think, so that they don't give him a, a payout because he already has a job. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I don't think we, our contract clauses are, are at that level where people have the foresight to say, you know, if, and I mean, if, if, Molef, Molef in Turkey wasn't he didn't resign either so uh, you know the, the, the onus wasn't on him to uh, not to find a job they sacked him and uh, I mean legally he could have challenged the, the fact that you know what uh, if you sack me uh, you can't limit me from, from finding another job uh, in Pochettino's case I mean you can imagine the amount of zeros they put in front of him to sign a contract that says even if we sack you, you can't work in the Premier League, you know, for at least 18 months or something. Um, I, I don't think South African clubs even consider that. Um, and, I mean, it would actually help because then we wouldn't see the merry-go-round merry we see uh, every season here. Uh, but from what I understand, I think uh, Chiefs had actually approached uh, Molef Nseki um, shortly after he was he was fired, um, or his representative. Shortly after uh, the coach was fired from from Bafana, and when they wanted to appoint him assistant coach, and it, it it would only make sense that you know I I don't think there's anyone who would who would choose Safa over Chiefs. Um, and uh, I think it's it's just unfortunate that you know uh, the speculation is is always going to be there on why Gavin was sacked. Um, I, I don't I, I wouldn't put it to an accusation that you know we are, um, I mean Messi is the excep exception because after the third year team win the league and then still contest the CAF Champions League so. Um, I definitely think, you know, they shouldn't be uh, upset about a coach coming in and saying, you know what, we, we need to uh, release all these senior guys. And and to be fair, I don't think 
Gavin would have, I mean, he, he depended heavily on Parker still. So it's not like he was saying everyone over 30 out. Uh, I'm sure it, it was based on, on what he saw in training, how he felt about certain characters. Um, and I, I do believe that uh, the decision was a bit rash. Um, if you look at the merits, uh, you know, what he was doing, what he had done, he built on on uh, the foundation that, that Middendorp had set with, with the youngsters that were promoted. Uh, he tried to make the most of a young team under uh, a transfer ban, which uh, I don't think many coaches would be able to do much better. Uh, I, I doubt Coach Pizza would have been able to do anything with, with the Sundowns team uh, under a transfer ban, uh, to be honest. So uh, that, that in itself was, you know, that should have been a, a scrap. Whatever he achieved, uh, in his first season under a transfer ban should have been scrapped and he, he should have been assessed based on on you know That's this it. fresh season where where this, the transfer ban is over there's no hindrances or anything and and he gets to to feel the players he wants to feel so uh long story short i i, I think um Gavin's sacking was was very premature um i think he could have he could have built something sustainable at chiefs um, and, you know, I, I just hope that, as I said earlier, uh, Baxter doesn't, you know, just dismantle everything and, and you know, build for, for instant success and instant gratification uh, because his head is on the block and the likes of Nobo, Blom, uh, Ngezana are all sidelined because they just don't fit the, the narrative. So um, I guess we'll have to see and, and it'll be interesting to see what Chiefs fans say uh, next season when, when Baxter has been there for, for 15 games and, and where Chiefs will be on the on the log. Yeah, thank you so much for your time. Uh, it's been it's been it's been a great chat chatting talking to you and it's been insightful. And you know what? Uh, I, I'd like to thank you very much for your time, Chad. I don't know I'm repeating this, but yeah it's it's been a very great conversation that we've had and yeah, most of the times when I do interviews, I, I kind of prefer to have uh, a, a conversation uh, and not too much of a, what an interview to, to kind of mm-hmm. get to know the person and to also get your yeah. insights on certain things. Yeah, no, it, it was lovely. I, I mean, I haven't, I haven't done one of these in, in a while, uh, you know, where I get literally asked to, to reveal things I know that I haven't published or anything like that. So um, I, I, I actually enjoyed it. Uh, your questions are, are actually very, you know, thought provoking and it's not, uh, you know, the usual ones where it's like, uh, uh, it's, it's, what you're asking me is, is, is stupid. And, uh, you know, some, sometimes you, you get guys who, who are not very clued up, but your questions come from a position of, of interest, from a position of passion and, and you know, you know what you're talking about and you know, you know, how you want to steer the conversation, which is, which is really great. It, uh, it, it's, it's good for, for anyone to, to have that. And, and I, I mean, I do interviews all the time and, and I actually, I felt like, you know, now I know what it's like to be interviewed by myself. <laughs> so uh, I hope you keep it up. I, I hope you continue growing, uh, work at your craft and, and I hope to see you, uh, on our TV screen soon uh, um, in, in doing what you're doing now. Thank you very much, Chad. And that's it. <laughs> it's great words coming from you. Uh, it's, it really is. It's, uh, it's very heartwarming. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually very heartwarming because yeah. sometimes you, you yeah. do get frustrated. Actually, when you were speaking about um, a person kind of like keep on working on, on your craft and sometimes you get uh, what's this frustrated because actually I DM a lot of people asking for interviews and you get a lot of no's but the yeses also come and through the yeses I, I get great conversations. I, I'll tell you now as as established as, as I seem to be you know on social media and all that players still blue tick my whatsapp still don't respond to my instagram dms uh they can even tell me hey call me tomorrow at five o'clock and when i call at five (laughs) no 
mandando um message. They just go ghost on me. So you you'll never be you know a lot of the time. I literally have to option option one to option four uh, in terms of of planning interviews and stuff. Yeah, uh, thank you. I don't you. get one, two. I have to go to three, four, and don't don't get you know discouraged or disheartened. Uh, it, it's nothing personal. Mm. Um, I think it's it's definitely something wrong with 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 our mentalities in in our football that you know players actually see interviews as as a as a burden and, and as something like you know it's sad because uh, footballers be comfortable in interviews and stuff because they feel like oh these ones are out to expose us or they're going to ask us uh, tough questions and it, it's just so sad so don't get discouraged if someone doesn't respond to you or, or doesn't come back to you they're probably just fearful or or they're just arrogant full of themselves which is also I mean you can't blame them you you're definitely mm. going to come across uh, arrogance and, and self-centeredness in, in this industry yeah and I I, I won't give up and I've gotten a lot of no's, but the yeses have, have given me great, ins- great conversations because I was speaking to Ria the other day and he was, um, mm. it, when I was reading in between the lines, he wanted to uh, kind of leave sundowns, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you see, you pick up those things and, and sometimes it, it, it makes it, uh, you know, your effort worth it when, when you pick up something that, uh, you know, others tend to miss and, and others don't have access to. So uh, just keep going and, you know, one day you, you'll get a, a Riyad Peters uh, perhaps who says, you know what, I want to leave Sundown. So you'll get a, a Bernard Parker that says, you know what, I should have left Chiefs in 2017, uh, but uh, the money was too nice or something like that. And, and it, you know, it, it makes the job worth it. And, and those are your, your sort of scoops um, that that you work towards, you you perfect your your craft and and you invest time in the way you interview that you actually get information that no one else is able to get. So um, big ups to you, man, and keep going. Uh, don't drop your your head. Uh, just keep fighting, and and if ever you need some advice or, or some assistance, uh, just reach out and and I'll try and help as best as I can. Thank you very, very much. And yeah, uh, I do have, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I will keep in touch. And thank you very much for your time. It's been an honor and a pleasure to actually have you on on this show. And yeah, guys, this has been Sports Talk with Kifu. And I was to, and today was an interview with Chad Kelly Clayton. And you guys should actually watch the entire thing because it's full of um, great conversations and Great information for you guys if you want to know. And thank you guys. Thank you guys for watching. And thanks, thanks, Chad. Awesome, guys. Don't forget to subscribe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And oh, before I actually leave, uh, what are your okay, but I'll tag you on Instagram, but what are your Instagram handles and uh, Twitter? Uh my Twitter is C Clayty, C K L A T E Y. And on Instagram, it's C K Lately. Uh, it's C Clayty with an L between the E and the Y, just as you know, Instagram is is current uh, affairs. So I just say C K lately. Mm. Yeah, thank you so much, and yeah, shout.